Oh, we don't need no fancy words. I mean, we need to practice. We need to rehearse. I'll tell you what we need. We need some paying gigs. We don't need this messing around first one patio and then another, and that's ridiculous. Welcome to the No GD Band Podcast. Hey, um, 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 uh. I'm just going to let you roll on that. Keep hey, going. Hey, um, did you start singing that or was it me? I think I started singing while we were setting up. And anyway, I'm Chris, by the way. Yeah, sorry. I totally, totally. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to the No GD Band Podcast. And uh, so it's been what? Two weeks? It's been two or three weeks. So if you do miss us, go over to uh, 80s Music Exposed and check out that pod because we're working probably harder on that one just because we have to do actual research and shit yeah yeah um that's been one thing but and and we'll talk more about that over there but this, there's something i swear to god there's something gained about uh having your hand forced into listening to records that you might not otherwise yeah it's have really, done it's you know cool. and i'll tell you something else it's cool because we've grown a little bit is um a guest from was it two episodes ago or last episode Mr. Greg Levin mm-hmm. um, has decided in a nice way, really nice, to help us out with the podcast and lend some of his engineering and production expertise. So thanks, Greg. This weekend I went to the mountains with my wife and we went hiking on a new trail um, it's like a three-mile trail, and it went down into the Linville Gorge, and at the bottom, there was like a waterfall, and then a couple uh-huh. of cool swimming holes, and so we are in one of the swimming holes, and this um, individual hiker guy comes up to us, asking me where the trail ends up, like the, from the direction we came from. He had never been on that trail before, and I said, well, where were you coming from? And he kind of told me where he parked his car, but I'd never heard of it, and, he, and I was like, how long have you been hiking? And he was like, oh man, I've been out here two days. What? So when he said that, I'm like, he didn't have a pack on or nothing. He So, Henry, he had, like, tactical pants on. Like, you buy at an Army-Navy store. You, lots of, like, side pockets and all that kind of stuff. And what? that material, that, like, kind of polyester kind of... Okay. Uh, Was or, it real billowy, like? Not too billowy, but, yeah, a little wide. And then he had on combat boots, and he had on a knife strapped to his belt, and... Real short hair, aviator sunglasses, and this black t-shirt with like a white negative image of the American flag. And it was long ways on the shirt and it was melting off his shirt. And he was the spitting image of Timothy McVeigh. The Oklahoma. former military guy that uh, blew up the Oklahoma City uh, government building. And so then he starts talking about, I'm trying to get off the grid. Mm-hmm. And then he, Henry, he just starts going into some of the most... Um, Alex Jonesy type conspiracy stuff you'd ever want to hear. That had to make you feel like a little. You're out there in the middle of nowhere, and this rando guy just runs across you with knives and shit. Starts talking about maybe he's packing, maybe he's not in those pockets right. that he's got. Starts right? talking about FEMA death camps mm-hmm. and um, the riots in Charlotte, and that WalMarts were taken over and stuff was uh, looted, not not to take, yeah. just to be looting did you try not to take issue with this shit or did you oh yeah i didn't disagree but i kept trying to redirect but i couldn't get him off it and he talked about um why were the people put in the superdome after katrina when there was a fema camp within 20 miles it's because uh the fema camps were full of homeless people that they were killing off and exterminating and that the governor of south carolina he knew so did the conversation start out like benign yeah like like about directions and how you doing, where you're from. Did he say that to you? Mm-hmm. And then where you're from. And he, and he's he's real nice, but uh-huh. like you can see when he gets worked up, there underneath his eyes, there's like this, back here. Yeah, there's an anger and a like a paranoia, that, like you know. And then he starts talking about going to Montana, and then he starts talking about going to Argentina, getting off the grid and going to Argentina, which, if you've done any research, South America, like Argentina is the place to go for right wing off the grid guys i didn't I, know that yeah because that's where like the nazi all the nazis were supposed to have relocated after world war ii and that they were harbored there and 
there's even conspiracy nuts that think that Hitler didn't die, that, he that he's still alive. I have read that. And all this kind of stuff. I didn't know that that was the, the root of the Argentina thing. I, I didn't know where it came from, to be honest with you. And anyway, so we kind of just say, yeah, 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 and just kind of let him peter out. And then he goes on up mm-hmm. the trail. And then I'm, you know, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm like, you know, this is crazy because 90% of the people we've talked to on the trail so far have been hippie, kind of Asheville mm-hmm. granola types. This seems like a 2018 kind of, there was just this overhanging dread from every side about what's going on with our country right about now. About the future. I mean, yeah. you're, you know, I, I, I'm on a nice hike in the woods and there's a guy that literally thinks one disaster is three days away from all of us dying. I even told the guy, you shouldn't waste your whole life worrying about that if we're all going to die. If we're all going to die, then just live your life and be happy. Why get so worked up about it? Uh-huh. And he was like, I'm not going to die. I'm, I, oh, I I'm can prepared. take care of myself. But, yeah. the, but the interesting thing was this guy was felt so far gone to me, Henry, that I don't even think he was a Trump guy. He was basically, uh, the government is not your friend. Nothing about the government is good. Um, they're all out to get us and kill us, and it's just, it was just crazy. Well, you know, a, a guy like that may not even kind of ruined re- realize that, that but for the protection of some sort of government, he wouldn't be able to arm himself or uh, care for himself or have... But you know, Henry, it, or have the roads to get to where he is. I'm I, I'm literally like in that. a situation where I'm sitting there watching this guy's face, going, "This is going to be the guy in five years that I'm going to be on the news." Going, I saw this guy hiking, you know, after he does some sort of crazy something. That's what I, the feeling I got. Man, it's like the world we live in now. I just can't imagine ten years ago actually running into somebody like that in the middle of uh, a nice hike in the Appalachian. No, Park. I don't think ten years ago that would have even occurred to me that people like that existed. I guess. Right, and it's. I think it's just more common because we're all feeling it from all this. Uh, you know, we went on a bike ride the other night. We went on a Plaza Midwood uh, group bike ride, and one yeah. of our friends, who is a therapist, was saying. Uh, the, just the level of anxiety has gone up in the last collective, year. Just yeah. a collective anxiety because we're all feeling it from the way things are in our country. And uh, suicide rates have gone up. Yeah, yeah. It's in just the, in the last few years. It's weird, but, but speaking of politics. Is there hope? Like, it, all right, so. Well, you tell me because right, so I was yes, trying to figure out this Tuesday primary. Look, I'm suspicious, mostly because I'm not sure that I'm buying into the left-wing spin on a thing. Like, is this... Is that just because I'm reading this, or is it really like... Um, I feel like it's muted enough that it must have been bad news. I think we can both take yeah. away from Tuesday's primary that there's not really a takeaway yet. We're still in wait-and-see mode. That all, from what I'm reading, the spin is that uh, it's it's good science for the Dems all the way around, but, um, you know... We'll see. I don't, I don't believe anything. They, they also said Hillary was going to win two right. years ago, so... Well, tell me about this. You've got a story, a good Dude, story that happened this, to you. And I've been retelling it. I've been retelling it a few times. I've worried about like letting this stretch on to half an hour. My, I have a friend that lives down the street um, who dates on, online uh, a lot. He's you know probably about fifty years old. Divorced. Has a child. Mm-hmm. Okay. Has a, a little girl about um, my daughter, my daughter's age, and. Uh, Remember when I went to the World Cup? I talked about it on the pod. Yeah, you went and watched a World Cup match uh, right. at a bar. Your first kind yeah, of yeah. He invited me, so that was the time. So we go. I go, and he actually has a date with him that night. Somebody he's met on a dating site. I don't know which dating site. It could have been plenty of fish. It wasn't Tinder, reportedly, but but she was from out of town, right? She wasn't even from Charlotte. No, she's from out of town. I mean, a good bit out of town. Yeah, about an hour and twenty minutes away. Okay, all right. And so uh, we had a, we had our time, and we had an evening, and she went away. Long story short, is he is it didn't really work out. They were not compatible or whatever. He broke it off with her. Fast forward, we have a pool party at my at my neighborhood, and um, my friend was also there because we call, were neighbors. Let's call him. Uh... Uh, Michael Douglas, and we'll call her Michael. Glenn Close. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Michael Douglas is there with me, and he says, guess what? Uh, Glenn Close is here at the party. And I'm like, no way. 
She is not. What are you? I'm looking around. I don't see Glenn Close anywhere. Around 11.30 or so, uh, Michael Douglas comes up. Michael? Michael says, <laughs> I saw Glenn here. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I talked to her uh, Her date. He's from Texas. So so Glenn Close bought a date. He Right. He confirmed that she was there. I was like, that's fucking crazy. That's bullshit. And they had talked. And, yeah, he seems like a good guy. Things like that. So we go and uh, sit at the table. And I... And we can't believe that this is happening. I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of tossing back the ranch waters one after another. But but I'm with it enough to kind of know this is fucking crazy that somebody would just show up like that. They're trying to shut the pool down at 12, but it's about 12, 15, something like that before we finally start getting it together. And as we start gathering stuff a little bit, here comes Glenn Close making a, you know, making a beeline right for him. And they go pair off. And um, I can't believe that. She just marched right up to him. Anyway, she apparently sent her her date packing. And I'm thinking, I don't really want the party to be over. I, I want to see how this turns out. And I said, well, you want to come hang out on my deck in the back? And we'll, you know, hang out for just a little while longer. I come back home, and here they are walking up to my house. Michael and Glenn. Michael and Glenn and her two kids. So, so where were the kids during the party? They were in the parking lot of the pool. I should have been like, I, I should have, that should have been a red flag, but I was kind of already, I kind of had already extended it, and I thought, so what, what, what so could go, possibly go bad? So they come in, we, uh, the kids come in, we make them a DiGiorno, so we don't know what to do, and, um, and she comes out back. And How old are the kids, by the way? The kids, one is... 13 the other is 20 20 and my daughter's hanging out there a 20 year old and like she she's like what are these weird kids doing here and it's three o'clock in the morning we just started shutting the shutting the party down and the kids are still in there watching and TV. right um and uh and so my understanding is that the kids went home because there's a 20 my, year old so he drove but, home but michael douglas and glenn close left together and went to michael's house. and went to michael's house and that's the last I heard of it. Well, next week, I find out that he's cut it off with her again, that it didn't work out. And she okay. started sending screeds of texts about... Another you know, red flag. Another red flag. Okay, fast forward to thir- Thursday of that week. Um, we get a digest of uh, police reports for the area sure, that you're sure. in, like, based on the zip code. And so they sent... Uh, one to my wife. What she saw was the top line that said assault in the 7700 block of this street. And she clicked through on it. She's like, that's the pool. And she clicked through on it and it was forcible rape. So we're thinking, oh my God, some jogger has gone through there and gotten raped at the pool because it's really close to the greenway. You fax away for the police report the next day we get the police report and it's sent back and turns out that a 43 year old female has told a a Charlotte Mecklenburg detective that she was raped at the pool and uh, we quickly put two and two together after looking at the incident report because it said that it took place on that Sunday at one o'clock in the morning when I'm like, well, this just happened within minutes after we were there. We looked at the age of this person, and we were like, oh, my God. We, it's Glenn. And it, it's Glenn, and, and she's Michael. making a rape claim against Michael. And you know it's bullshit because Glenn and Michael were at your house. Right, and I've got camera. I've got a, a, you know, a Nest camera pointed right out, and I see her right there in my house, so I know it's bullshit. And you've got it on recording. Right, and so I send it to Michael, and I had him... Um, I was like, what do you think? And so it was all this big back and forth stuff about how, um, uh, about the whole evening and when he passed by and when he went home and all of that. So he proactively called the detective and the detective said, if you hadn't called me, I never would have called you because it would have been he said, she said. And I'm, at that moment, I'm thinking, that's kind of fucked up. Right. Like they should pursue it. Which kind of tells you in a, in a weird roundabout way, as long as... You rape a woman, and it's just the two of you. He said, she said. There's no other evidence. Cops aren't even going to follow up on it. I don't know if they will or not. 
I know that we dealt with it last weekend. Michael said that we uh, that he gave the detective my uh, phone number and and who I was because you had evidence because I have video evidence of, of right. things that occurred and what time that it, it was on my camera, and that the detective said he would contact me. It is now all. It is now Thursday. He's not. He's he closed. He has not it. contacted me at all. Well, let's, let's so, so so the go. other and and to finish this up, the other is, issue too is the ex-wife who lives in uh, another state, right? Yep. Got a call. Oh yeah, got a call from D from the uh, Department guess, of Social, Department Service. Ser Social Services in that state. In in that state, at, saying that uh, Michael drank too much and had his daughter sleep with him, and he touched her. And so the daughter had to be interviewed by DSS in that state. That's right. So that's what Michael told me. This is this she's is all created hell from an and internet date. Dating. Yeah, all of that. And here's the problem: like the reason this probably incensed Je uh, Jessica, my wife, so much is that when people make false accusations like that, it casts doubt on other people who make valid real, real right. right. Who make valid claims. Right. Right. Think, I Which mean, even makes the cop think, think well, that's yeah, why I don't He said, she said, this is why I don't fall through. Right. Because some of them are fake. Well, it's, it's a... bullshit. It's a... It's a uh, anyway, there's a special place... There's a special place in hell for people like that. Yep. Oh, show me the way to the next whiskey bar. Oh, don't ask why. No, don't ask why. All right, Henry, what are we drinking tonight? All right, this time we're drinking, it's called Creek Water. I'm trying to figure out where it's from, to be honest with you right now. But we, it's, it's 100 proof. And we saw it on special at the ABC stores. I'm going to say this about it. It doesn't, it doesn't taste near as bad as I thought it was going to taste. <laughs> It's not like fire water or anything. It's it's kind of smooth. I don't know what kind of hangover it's going to produce. Because I, I didn't know it was 100 proof until you just said that. It doesn't taste 100 proof. That's what's scary about it. Like it sneaks up on you? Yes. I'm trying to find the... That's uh, how old we are. When we were 25, we'd have been like, hell yeah, I didn't know it was 100 proof. That's great. I think I bought it because I like the name Creek Water. It's got a cool label. Yeah, they don't have anything about oh, what, it. Tell them, tell everybody what the the stopper of the bottle is like. One of those old from the yeah, 70s. Yeah, where you flip it up and uh, it's got and a little it rubber down. Clamp. If R people throw these, do you remember away, that in the 70s, like when you had uh, glass bottle uh, Pepsi's and Cokes? You had to keep some of those things around in a drawer. <laughs> I do. So when you would open the Pepsi, you'd only drink part of it. You'd have to. Uh, yes. You'd have to cap it again let me let me so. I, you know this just made me think of this you know they sell those big glass bottle um mexican cokes with the sugar cane in them yeah those are the same size they, they used to come in six packs in the 70s do you remember that no i don't remember that so before they invented two liters that's how you would get your coca-cola uh -huh. and like we kept it in the pantry closet in the floor and you would open one of those and you pour yourself a glass of coke or pepsi and then you would put one of these stopper things on the bottle Really? Now, they sell those glass bottle Cokes. You wouldn't even dream of not drinking the whole thing. It's one liter. It's a one liter bottle of Coke, the Mexican Coke. And you're not like, oh, where's the stopper so I can take the rest of this home? Because in 2018, you just drink a liter of Coke. Mm -hmm. Whereas in 1979, 10-year-old Chris would have been like, a liter of Coke? That's three, that's awful that's three lot of Cokes. Coke. That's three nights worth of Coke. All right, Henry, so I saw this, uh, I, you know, one of those kind of clickbaity articles in my news feed about, mm -hmm. um, I actually saw the IGN, uh, which is a gaming website, had posted the 100 greatest video games of all time. I, didn't, I mean, that's so subjective. Well, I, it, the funny thing is, I, I, it, it was very subjective, but I, I wanted to kind of use their list as a reference, and mm -hmm. by the time I got to number 20 through 1, I didn't know any of the games, because, like, games have passed me by. 
So I thought we would, I, I kind of fished around more for a classic uh -huh. games, top 20 site. And then I thought, why don't we do a top five list of our own favorite games? And it could be I anything. Like that. It could be like what, home at, games or computer at, games. At what point do you think you stopped paying attention? I had a PS3 game system, but I, I realized before it blew up that uh -huh. I was already done because all I was playing on it was Ms. Pac-Man. Uh, which is not meant, it, you know, it's not, it's meant to play. Basically, the games have gotten to this point, Henry, where everything are these massive online mm -hmm. shoot 'em ups. Where if I tried to get in one of those games, little kids would kill me within two seconds of me touching down in the game. Mm -hmm. And then they talk junk. Your self esteem is getting bashed by a seven year old kid who's got awesome slams, really good slams, <laughs> while he's murdering you, literally, in a video game, and you didn't even see him murder you, you're just dead. Like, I, was, I didn't even see him, I'm just dead, and then there's some kid talking shit. You come alive again, and you're like, all right, where are you? And all of a sudden, you're dead again, and the kid goes, ho, 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 nida. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's an insult, but it's in another language. But I think he's speaking English, and I'm not sure what he's saying. <laughs> so I just load up Ms. Pac-Man, you know, and play that. I'm going to start at number five, actually. Oh, you want to go I'm backwards? Gonna, I'm going to go from the, from the okay. bottom up. So okay. number five for me is an Atari 2600 game, home game called Pitfall. The, that, the Easter eggs, I think, was the first, that was the first game that my brother and I were aware of Easter eggs. Was that eggs. why it was cool? I think or? for us it was. My brother ended up taking graph paper so that he would know when he got back to the original first screen. He had a notebook. <laughs> he graph papered the whole thing. And then, of course, once he was done, he never looked at the notebook again. It wasn't like he went through and um, he probably could have sold that notebook. I don't, I don't know. but well, So my number so, five. Yeah, what's your number five? It is, it's pole position. That's a classic. Classic. I, I mean, the, you spent all night, uh, all evening playing that. And you sat down in it. You could. There were two versions. There was a sit right. down and a stand up. Right. You could do either one. Yep. Yeah, my... Um, when I was a kid, one of my first experience going into an arcade was with my cousin Tanya. And she's the same person really that like introduced me to like more other music. All that stuff she introduced me to, including that weird culture surrounding arcade games and like how they smelled. You know, there was something about that smell that, that you, nobody can really duplicate it. There's a place in Asheville that is a video game museum, they call it. But if you walk at the back, they have basically recreated all those, you know, hole in the wall type uh, arcade places from the 80s. Right. And the way that they smelled. There was a special, it, it had, it smelled like people and plastic. And it was that electrical smell. Right. That kind of permeated the air that I've never smelled. So when I walked in there, I was like, this is, it's exactly, um, it took me back exactly to that time because you know your memory is often tied into your smell. Right. So my number four, Henry, is yep. a classic Galaga. It actually one of those games, Henry, where if you get to a certain level, mm -hmm. it gets easy again. No. Yeah, like it starts. So it kind of like starts over. Really. Yeah. Great game though. It was the first game, so it was kind of like. It, it, but I think somebody could easily dismiss it as a Space Invaders ripoff. Well, it was. Right? It, to me, it was like, that's what I liked about it because yeah. it was like, I thought Space Invaders was too basic <clears throat> Excuse me. at the time. Yeah. And Galaga was like what I wanted Space Invaders to be like. So yeah, Galaga's my number four. What's your number four? My number four, I'm calling it Punch Out. Body blow, body blow. And I even had the, I even, I even went through the renaissance of... When it became Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Oh, you followed the, it that far. Yeah, because you got new. There were new characters. The weird thing about Punch Out, I come to see now, is there wasn't any special skill involved. In there the game. It was. You got further. There was a. There's timing issues with the guy because the guy's ticks would be so quick. Uh huh. You had to have really good timing, Dang. and then you had to go wait, wait. Wait, wait, jump, and then you had to punch him right in the face. If you had that on a home system, you could play it over and over and over to get it. I like that this is your number three, but it, it, it's a specific one. You wrote down Space Invaders at the Kmart. Yeah, because, you know, your parents I would go shopping. It was fucking boring, right, to go in there while they were shopping. You didn't care what they were shopping about, but you and your little brother, even if you didn't have any quarters or anything, we would sit there and stare at the at the things marching back and forth on the screen. All right, my number three game. So I so as as far as home games go, anybody that known that's known me well for the last twenty years knows that my 
where I excel, where I, where I jam on video games is racing games. <laughs> and my favorite racing game of all time is called Gran Turismo. Yeah. The reason I love Gran Turismo is because when it came out, it starts you on the shittiest cars in the world, Ford Festivas, which Henry has. <laughs> which I had. Henry actually had a real one. And that made <laughs> that was me, my second car. Which I love because I could vouch for how realistic it was on the video game. You start racing those, and they won't do shit. <laughs> and so the whole game, you build up. You have to get driver's licenses, and you have to pass um, driving tests and do all this shit to get to real racing cars. But as you're working your way up through the cars, they get better and better in the way that real cars do. So you couldn't just take a, a Toyota Celica and drive it like a Ferrari. Uh -huh. It drove like a Toyota Celica. So... When I was in law school, uh -huh. uh, my sister and her now husband, Doug, lived with me in an apartment. And they, if they're listening, they can both vouch for this. Mm -hmm. I got so sucked into these realistic driving games that I played an entire season of NASCAR on full length with full damage. So I would spend Sunday afternoons doing a three-hour fucking race <laughs> on the video three game. Three hours. And at Jesus. least twice in the season... I got two and a half hours in and got wrecked, and the game was, and I, and that was it. The race was over, and it was such a deflator of my psyche that I was like, I need to focus on school again. I need to get back into um, worrying about law school shit. Reading some shit. <laughs> What's your number two, Henry? There's... Fucking combat, man. There were so many games there where you could bounce things off. I spent hours and hours with. Um, you know, my parents would drop me off at a babysitter, and the guy would have so, would have combat, and we would just play the shit out of it so all this, day long until really, your hand got cr got cramped up. This one really shocked me because to me, it had the stigma about it that it was the freebie that came with the with the twenty. I, I guess I never picked up on that, mm -hmm. and I liked I liked that you could do different ones. I like the one where you had the you three play planes on a versus team. one plane kind of thing. Do you remember that? Yes, two planes, three right. planes. It was like endless variations, and sometimes it would bounce off the wall. Well, I would get really angry because my brother, again, the nerd that he was, got really good at the tank game where he could get just sit in a spot, like yeah. way far away, and make it bounce like twelve times and hit me over and See, over like, and why, over. Why was it? I know. I fucking hate that. I hated that. And shit. there was something really um, harsh about the way the thing would hit your tank and spin, spin you out. And then the minute you came back to life, if he had hit his, if he had shot at the right time, yeah. you could never get out of it. He would just sit there and make you spin for 10 minutes going, <laughs> and you're just like, fuck, fuck. And and they all they had all these little designs and all these things that you and and it was basically the next step from Pong though my number two yes so this is a shout out to my friend Kristen Mack we were both obsessed with this game the game of the game is called Mist yes and I had that game what I love about Mist if you go back and look at it now is it plops you down in the middle of this island with this really creepy kind of music and ambient noise and it tells you nothing and that was the big the, the mystery part was the selling was the big sell on this right well like you basically you you had to figure out what you could do you had to figure out what you were supposed to what do. the goal was you, it, it gave you nothing and i will tell you this i still think of this to the day if you go back and watch it the very first episode the pilot episode of lost to me those guys came up with that from the beginning of Mist, because the the right at the beginning of Lost is pretty close to what happens at the beginning of Mist. Really? The plane crashes. They don't know what the fuck's going on. Nobody's telling them what the fuck's going on. And you, as the audience watching Lost, have no fucking idea what's going on. There's no narrator telling you nothing. It's just a bunch of people after a plane crash running around trying to figure out what the fuck's going on. <laughs> I don't even remember getting to the plane crash part. <laughs> oh, there is no now there is no plane crash part in Mist. I'm talking about Lost, the oh, show. I, but I, th but I, I think they saying. I think they extrapolated from Mist that idea of let's start a television show, uh -huh. which starts with an incident, but let's not tell anybody what they're supposed to be looking at, and let's right. not tell any of the characters 
what they're supposed to be doing with each other. I, I lost patience with it. I mean, after a few hours of playing it and I couldn't figure it out, I just I, I gave up. Yeah, and it's one of those where you can it won't give you any. I mean, you can sit for hours. But yeah, I, I always thought the cheat books were. I saw the cheat it, books. It wasn't too. worth it, you know. Because well, you, you then always that feel wrong. Defeats robbed. the whole thing. Because the minute you read the cheat, you're like, like oh yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, let's do it, Henry. What is your number one well, all right, time favorite? First video of all, game? let me set do the setup. I uh, I was looking for any opportunity I could to just to hang out with my buds. Um, the reason why I loved the game so much was because it, it I, I liked the controller. What, now, it, what game was it? Uh, Star Wars, where you had to defeat the Death Star, and so it, and it was a simple game to play. So it, the reason why I have such strong because I you know this was a, a particularly you know. Heavy carefree time, time for you. Ca- right, carefree. Or, or, it was in, your hour and a half of, of of not having to to deal with anybody else, right. or, and I could just sort of be with my boys and 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 feel normal for an hour. Right. My number one. It's kind of boring, but it, but because I'm rated, and you can look this up on the website. I'm the nineteenth. Uh, I have the 19th highest score of all time on fast Ms. Pac-Man. Oh, there's different versions of. Oh yeah, of... I'm not I'm not good at regular Pac-Man. I Ms. Pac-Man. I, and by the way, my favorite number one game is Ms. Pac-Man. I am good at a particular type of Ms. Pac-Man called fast Ms. Pac-Man with slow ghosts. In the arcade, they had one of those barcades set up with one of those Ms. Pac-Man machines where they Ms. Pac-Man was fast, but the ghosts were slow. I ended up playing for like an hour and 45 minutes on one quarter. I busted the record of the guy that was in Winston-Salem, the record holder. My wife told the bartender to see if they'd put my name up and maybe we get a free drink. He actually called the guy to tell him somebody broke his record. By the time I'm finished, he's called that website from the King of Kong. They run a website with all the world records on it. Because the arcade vouched for me, they authenticated my score, and it turns out I had the 19th highest score ever. So I had or to take a picture of my score right then and there uh, and send it to them. Normally, they wouldn't authenticate from that, but they vouched, the arcade uh, guy vouched for the score being real. Well, how, uh, what other way are they going to authenticate? Well, you, normally, if you're making an attempt, they, if you're that good, if you're making an attempt, you you let them know you're making an attempt, and then oh, prior, right? And so, so somebody, so the has bartender. To be there. When I finished, the bartender asked me where I practiced at, where yeah. my home arcade was, and I was like, I haven't even played this game in ten years, and he's like, blew his mind. Like I was, it was the only time in my life that I felt like some sort of. Uh, like kid genius or something. A savant. <laughs> Maybe I should buy one. Mm-hmm. Really start practicing and see if I can get the world record. If I got 19 out of the gate. But I also feel like it's one of those things where I was like, that was just a perfect night. If you buy one and practice, yeah. you won't ever even hit that score. And you'll go insane and you'll hang yourself in the club. You, it's bec- you, the reason you did so well was because you, you didn't care about the outcome. No, I was just you trying did, to kill you time. Right. You weren't second guessing yourself in any way. You were just in a flow. Oh yeah, I didn't what? mention our honorable mention. This game called Tapper, which I absolutely love, and it almost made my top five. It's it was sponsored by Budweiser, I think, or Miller, one of the but. But it, you actually had a beer tap instead of a joystick. Yep. And the whole thing was you were just slinging beers before people could get to the end of the bar and there'd be like four bars i mean how do they let that be a game i love that that's the 80s it's man. about slinging beers you're slinging beer at your right. like i mean it this game came out in 83 later it was called root beer tapper oh right they tried right. to they tried to pc it your other honorable mention was mortal Kombat. mortal Kombat, which i want to say is where i think the <laughs> video games began to go to shit Really, I hated, I hated the fighting games with multiple moves you had to memorize instead of just a joystick and a button. Oh, I never said I was gonna get good at it. And all these different buttons, and then there were yeah. these certain kids that were so good at it you couldn't even. You were just like, it was the beginning of the age of just ah oh, fuck it. All right, so that's that's our run through the world of video games. Again, if you want to hit us up and let us know some of your favorites, we would love to bring them up on the next episode. Yeah, so. tell us something we forgot. Chris, you, here's something you didn't mention. Sim City, what the fuck? Vai, vai, vai pra Luanda. Vem, vem, vem de Luanda. Deixa tudo que é triste. Vai, vai, vai pra Luanda. Vai, vai, vai pra Luanda. Have you 
heard of this rapper named Tierra Whack? <laughs> no, but you. I got it in the show notes and I pulled it up and I was like, this looks racist, but <laughs> tell me. What well, am I missing? I'd, I'd heard people talking about Tierra Whack and I thought uh, they were talking about the way young people now are mastering the mediums that are presented before them and they're mm-hmm. thinking in ways that we would never think but doing things like you know it, it reminded me of our whole diy era mm-hmm. in the 90s we did with what we were given mm-hmm. this this rapper girl tiara whack mm-hmm. um she made an album before she had a record deal or any kind of album of 15 one minute songs it's a 15 minute album the reason she made one minute songs was that is how long Instagram will allow you to post a video. So she made 15 one-minute songs with a little video for each one, and they're over in a minute. And then um, a record company loved it, loved what she did, signed her. They did re-release it as an album, uh, which is where I heard it on iTunes. And the funny thing was, before I heard the people talking about it, I had downloaded it just to hear it, Uh and I kept getting pissed because I kept hearing these songs that I thought were good, and then they would just stop. And I would be like, what is going on with this girl's, like, why is she stopping? She took what she knew, which was Instagram, and she turned that into a way to put out her music. So, and it was, it was like, maybe it's a, you know, sometimes how your limitations make you be creative. Right. That's what I'm saying. She took what she was given. And, and, you know, if I, if if me and you had thought about it, we would have just bemoaned that Instagram doesn't let you do longer songs Mm -hmm. and never put a song up there. She was like, fuck it, I'll make 15 I'll make the- one minute songs and put it up there. So here's the here's one of those songs and I'm gonna play it in its fucking entirety because it's one minute long. And it's called Hookers. I'm tired of trying love. You try to buy my love. I'm tired of crying up. You try to buy my love. So that, I mean that's it. That's it. I mean that's all that I was, get. That was hookers. <laughs> I mean, and and if you listen to all fifteen, if you listen to the record, it's called Whack World. Are they all that good? They're all really good. But the funny thing is, so she gets to the chorus. And well, stops. there's even more that don't even get. Sometimes don't even feel like they get to the chorus. But there's there's literally like you, you when you're done, you're like, can I get the rest of these songs somewhere? There's got it. Like she had to finish them. That's Somewhere. a totally original thing. Yeah, that's really neat. She was really cool. But it, there's right. a there's a long form video that goes with the album. It's 15 minutes long. That, that goes that's on goes like, from song to song to song. Is that the YouTube clip on here? Yeah, and it's really cool. All right, saving it to my library. Tierra Whack. Good okay. find there, London. Also, Henry, since the last time we talked, I went to see a movie called Sorry to Bother You. I thought it was amazing. Um, what I know I've about? heard a lot of people that have kind of knocked it because it's not um, it's not polished enough and it's not Hollywood enough and it's got a fucked up ending. And I'm like, well, who would do that? It feels like guerrilla movie making. The guy that made it is named Boots Riley, mm-hmm. who is in a who's a rapper in a band I believe called the 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 Coup, mm-hmm. and they've been around for 15 years or more. Um, I actually found a a uh, clip of him when he appeared on uh, Bill Maher's show back when Bill Maher was on his original show on no shit. ABC. Yeah, <laughs> that long ago. Yeah, so Christ. this guy's in his—he's our age, and yeah. um, the movie looks like a first-time director. Uh, um, it doesn't look as low budget as people I think people make it out to be. It's got a lot of good people in it. Lakeith Stanfield, who if you watch the show Atlanta, you will know him. Uh-huh. Um, he's the kind of kooky guy on Atlanta. The kind of kooky. Oh, Paperboy's oh, best the, friend. Yeah, the other guy. That I love that guy. Yeah, he's cool. Um, 
uh, Tessa Thompson is on the sh- is in the movie who I think is just gorgeous and amazing. And I don't know her. She is also on a show called Westworld. Do you watch Westworld? Yeah. Okay, so she's the. Um, oh, she's the younger. The um, younger executive. executive. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And then uh, Army Hammer makes a, an appearance in it, who's a kind of a bigger name star. Um, it is wacky. It is wild. It like. It moves like. I don't even know how to explain. It, it moves like you're, vignette. You're being vignette. very vague. Well, I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to ruin it for me. Yeah, I, I don't want to ruin it for anybody out there because it's it's a uh, it's a crazy plot. It does move like you're inside this guy's boots' brain, and it's just like man, okay. it's kind of manic. It's, it's like a stream of consciousness kind of almost. Thing. It's just like and it's farcical. I think he called it uh, magical realism. Mm-hmm. So it's got a lot of it's got a lot of like farcical stuff going on, but he is cutting capitalism to the bone in every way like he is slapping all these different ideas about how shitty capitalism is up on a wall and i know i've I've read a lot of criticism about it that it goes in too many different directions but i think that was the whole point he's just like showing all the different ways capitalism fucks people and you know that you start off you think the movie's about race and then all of a sudden it's about class and then all of a sudden it's about television how shitty television is and then it's about advertising and then it's about um oh yeah how people everyone's trying to fuck you and then it's just like it's got all these things going on and he doesn't give a shit if it doesn't come back to one or the other right it's like punk rock it's just like but it does have a plot that goes all the way through. So there's, it's not like. So there's a thread of a, of a plot. Yes, but, yeah, you're not going to go to it and be like. But there's lots totally of non sequiturs like, and unanswered questions. And then there's and stuff that. that's just like fanciful. But, but in a way, like, to me, it reminded me a lot of Monty Python. Mm-hmm. Like, shit would just happen. Like, Terry Gilliam shit would happen all of a sudden. Like, some sort of goofy cartoon thing. And you're just like, that's okay. You know what I mean? It's Monty Python. I'm not like supposed to. But he's talking about a lot of real shit. And I thought, you know what? For a first-time filmmaker, I think it looks fucking great. Like, for a guy that's in a rap band that's making a movie, like, I wouldn't know the first thing about shooting a film. And this is... This is great. It's not like you're sitting there watching it going, this looks like The Room. You know, this looks like crap. Toon Yards did the music. Toon Yards did a lot of the music, and The Coup did a lot of the music, and... Um, anyway, check I'm it gonna out. I'm going to deliberately not read the plot. Don't. I don't want you to like... Because I will see this movie Yeah, eventually. and I, I was being intentionally vague about it, but but if, if you get a chance... Absolutely, I will. It or, ...or check it out. Uh, you wanted to talk about the Amy Winehouse documentary that's up on Netflix. Have you seen it yet? Yeah, I saw it when it came out. If it's the 2015 one called Amy. Yeah. I saw it when it came out. I watched it on, um, you know, as I want to do these days. I, uh, I watch stuff when it makes its way to streaming. And... Uh, uh, I, I was unexpectedly touched by it. If you look at it, I think you can you can see that fame is probably one of the worst things <laughs> to happen to fragile people. Yeah, you I know? yeah, I I think I think my interpretation of it was I didn't really value her talent. Uh-huh. Um, prior to the movie, I, I just knew her peripherally as a singer. We, we knew the Amy Winehouse they wanted us to see. But I also wasn't a big fan. So I just thought, well, she's kind of like um, Adele to me. Who, who, was, who's, she wasn't that, though. Who's talented. But, but, but this is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that, that was my I, right, that's, view of her. That, I guess that's what I'm trying to so say. So when I went into watching the documentary, I was watching it, sadly, for the purient. I want to see what it's like to watch a person deteriorate How and die is this yeah. but what i what i took out of it was oh my god she was amazing yeah and she was just fragile she wasn't a she didn't have a death wish my i thought she'd had a death wish before she just couldn't handle uh being that talented and what would come with being that talented yeah uh i think and it was really sad it was ringing really a bell for me was when uh i really thought back to black might have been the first thing that she did I didn't know her before that I either. Yeah, I didn't. Um, but it wasn't. Right. And they've got footage. They had a lot of camera footage, weirdly enough, of yes. her when she was young. I think that's I thought, what makes it really good. Yeah. And so, and I told Jessica as as I, the movie was over, I said, you know, I knew always knew she was a good singer. I didn't know that she wrote it all. 
And I didn't know that she could play guitar as well as she could. Well, and I also, I didn't know, in, in my like opinion... Like, she was a true musician. I kind of felt like she became this spoiled brat heroin addict who just wanted to do whatever she wanted to do. And yeah, she kind of, that's what happens. But, did but you, no, she, you, you realize from watching this movie, she's having the kind of reaction that I think a normal, a real normal human being would have to all this stuff being put on her. All of a sudden. All of a sudden. Like, I don't know if you watched it, but she's walking down the street trying to live a life of some kind. And you've got these things going off in your face over and over and over and over. And, and you over had no and preparation and for it. And you can't, yeah, you can't do anything about it. You can't stop them. And what has happened has caused, is, has polluted the relationships that are close to you, like your father. And so you have no right. support system to try to reach right. out to. You you want to love people, but then you realize that the people that you did love um, are in it for what they can extract. It's like all of a sudden you not, look around and everyone's trying to use you. Yeah. And I'm, I feel like that same story has happened to many people who ended up on the wrong side of that stuff. But I'm like, I, what? Why, do you think Cobain really killed himself over the the stomach, or is it because he realized or or, or questioned all the reality that had surrounded him? But uh, yeah, you you sick. think about people that made art like Cobain and and Amy Winehouse that made the art in a certain um, setting. Uh huh. And then that setting is never achievable again because now they're famous. So like Cobain was a nobody sitting in a room doing his thing, mm -hmm. and that's how he created what everybody wanted from him. Mm -hmm. Now they want, this, they want more of it, and he's like, I'm living in a fishbowl. How am I even, first of all, right. I, I, and then I think there's this, this uh, level of, I can't give people what they want. Now there's all this pressure. Mm -hmm. And he just wants to go back to that little dingy room and do what he was doing before. But he's compelled to deliver. Or there's pressure but, to deliver, but right. he knows he can't because he's, he can't recreate the environment. Right. It's a weird thing where it's like, if me and you right now uh, made a record in my kitchen right here that went quadruple platinum, and then people said, make another one, we couldn't do it in this kitchen. No, we couldn't different... live on Pecan Avenue because we'd have to have bodyguards and we'd have mm -hmm. to have, you know, there'd be people trying to look in the windows and stuff. So we'd have to move somewhere else, which changes the environment. So it was like, no, and there's no See, school for people. Like, I thought she got super skinny before the movie because she was doing heroin. I think she went anorexic because... It's some it, level of control. She was internalizing this whole fucking It's madness. a level of control. Right. You know, um, that it's she can really have. sad, and I, and I, it's one of the only documentaries where I watched about a musician I really didn't care about, and by the end yeah. I felt this loss, like the whole world lost when this girl died, because she could have been. She was the real deal. The real fucking deal. Yeah. She was an Ella Fitzgerald. She was a Barbara Streisand. Yeah. She could have easily been another Barbara Streisand, no doubt. Yeah. And that's, in my mind, selling it's, it's short. It's a lot, but it's, well, yeah. I mean, it's a loss. Sure. Like, what I didn't figure out before, all these dead, you know, you know musician characters that I'd sort of chalked up to being, um, being selfish or whatever, I, what I didn't get was the reality distortion. Right. That that's surrounds it. Like, and another thing, like, where she was walking around St. Lucia, you know, it was a couple of years after we were there. Yes. Um, and how she just wanted to feel normal. Right. You know, and uh, and I, I think the fact that her father was pushing a different agenda, and I could see the camera could actually see that conflicted look about on her face when she's trying to deliver to things that right. are expected, as opposed to what her uh, her her real reaction would sure. be. That's when I got it. Right. You know, and in no other uh, none other of these sort of. Uh, Rockstar death things. Anyway, watch it. It's for fucking free on it. Netflix. Yeah, so. it's great. Well, Henry, uh, we we should we should definitely let everybody know again that we uh, have a sister podcast called uh, '80s Music Exposed, and um, we're, we're doing that kind of back and forth with this one. So we'll be back with some more No GD Band in a couple weeks. That's right. And um, say the words. All right, we ain't got no goddamn band, Chris. Yeah.